Um, my name is Georgianne Cannell, and I am here to talk with you about using the big ideas to create a succinct map of your course so that students can engage in that. And, you know, the title is Unburdening Curriculum, and so I really streamlined and unburdened this course so that you guys could get the maximum amount of working time today. If you didn't bring your syllabus today, don't worry. Um, if you're coming next Tuesday, we can start from that point then. Um, but there will be some work time today interspersed in between this, okay? So, our learning targets for today uh, are going to be that you're going to be able to conceptualize how your big idea can help with your course redesign, but like specifically what you're going to walk away with today is you're going to be able to demonstrate the language between an activity, learning target, and a big idea by filling out part of a learning progression. Okay. So, and if that sounds like gibberish, don't worry, it'll make total sense in a little bit. So before we get started, we should think about what it means to unburden, and I have a title here, and this is actually the title of the paper by Lucky at Owless, Teaching More Learning. And the idea is that we're allowing students to go in depth into a fewer number of topics versus the uh, more traditional breadth that they receive. And when we look at the literature, it's actually a really shallow, hi Anu, a really shallow literature base. Um, so in terms of what we see in the literature uh, for empirical data, there's really not a lot out there. There's two solid studies, one of which is a 10 year, uh, was a 10 year longitudinal study by Lucky et al that looked at non-majors biology. Um, and that's, that was really a pivotal paper that, that connected increased learning gains and positive course reviews with unburdening. Um, and so they streamlined their laboratory sequences. The other paper, um, which is also pivotal, is by Schwartz et al from 2008. And this was a very large study. Over 10,000 students were involved in this um, just in the United States. Student high school content was looked at. And if they went into depth for at least a month, into one of the content areas versus a tradi traditional breadth um, series within uh, biology, chemistry, or physics, uh, then they were considered to have had depth. And those students that had depth did better in college-related courses. And so there's all sorts of follow-up work there that needs to be done. But this is definitely an area of research that needs to be, it's very, very weak, I would say, at this, at this point. So you might be asking, well, why the fuss? Why are we talking about unburdening? Um, why all the fuss is because in order to create a really effective active learning classroom, you need to unburden. It should be a part of what we're doing um, in creating time for active learning activities, and there's a huge literature base for active learning. Okay, but specific unburdening, it's not the case in higher education. So that's what that looks like. What we're going to do right now is um, I'm going to model one of the student-centered activities, and I'm going to model a couple of these today. The first is... Um, that I want to get an initial, initial ideas check. And so I'm going to give you a prompt in just a moment. And um, what you're going to do is you're going to think about it individually. You're going to write about it. And then you're going to come up with some sort of a summary um, based off of the prompt. And we're going to do a parking lot. When you're done, you're going to come up here and park it up on the board. OK, so for a small class, this is a great way for students to report out. For a large <coughs> class, not so much. So when I have 180 or 90 students, um, it's obviously too much for that. So for a larger class, what I would do is um, I have them in fixed groups, and each group reports out to the discussion board. And so I'm up here, and I can see them report out. So no one's like getting up and moving, and it's not crazy. OK, so you're ready. What would you consider a smaller class, 30 or 40? Is that smaller? Yeah, yeah, uh, probably closer to 30. Yeah, 40 might be a little crazy. I would put them in pairs and have them report out in pairs in a class of 40. Okay. Yeah. So here we go. Think, write, post. That's my variation on this. Um, so I'm going to give you 10 minutes, and I want you to think about um, if you had two hours to impart the love of learning within your discipline to a group of students, only two hours, how would you choose to spend your time? Would you lecture core content? Would you immerse into a relevant issue or within your field? Or would you have combinations of that? And this might seem a little bit daunting, but I'll let you know that I forced myself to do this. And I sat down in my office, and it took me about 10 minutes, but I thought, OK, what is the crux of my discipline? What would be super exciting for students to get their hands wet in? You still have the constraints of the classroom, and you don't have a big budget. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to give you 10 minutes. The work that you do right now will be really important for the rest of today, and then also for Tuesday, next Tuesday. Okay. Some of these 
activity ideas. So we have a lot of different fields in here, which is pretty exciting. <laughs> um, so I, I just want to read a couple of these. So we've got unifying applied concepts. I would love to use this important topic to tie together many of the important concepts of the class, including natural selection, coevolution, and diversity of life using phylogenetics to trace back evolutionary histories. Awesome, okay, so there's one. Um, so that's a biological one. We've got uh, substitution and elimination. It's chemistry, I can explain it better. Reactions? Yeah, reactions. Reactions, yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So she would do a little lecturing on mechanism. Yeah. And then reaction conditions followed by basic examples, working groups, on a natural project, product? Yes, on a natural product, finding the substitution eliminations in them. And, and then showing the overall, and, the, and then showing the overall synthesis and where it actually applied in it. Yeah. Sorry, awesome. I couldn't all fit it on the post. Oh, that's good. I know, right? I almost said, like, can I get a bigger post it? <laughs> okay, and then a topic of variability and diversity in human societies and ways they interact with the environment. Specific topics, discussion about the uh, agricultural revolution progress or the worst idea ever. Awesome. <laughs> Just read a couple more here. Culture, music, art, festivals, and folklore. Contributions made by cultures and individuals best understood in the original language. Useful basic vocabulary to allow for intermediate communication skills. Okay, so you got some ideas of, of uh, some of the, the activity ideas up there. When I sat down to write this, um, I challenged myself to think of something new. Uh, I have about 15 activities that I use in a non-majors biology course, and I sat down and thought, okay, you know, what is something really new and exciting that I could do in class? And I'm just showing you this because I want to show you some of the scaffolding that's involved in creating in-class activities, because I think that might be useful. So, engaging their senses, uh, preconceptions, and metacognition. Those three variables seem to be particularly important for learning. So in, in this example, I would have laminated cards with an array of local organisms from Lake Whatcom, so something local that they can relate to. Um, something tangible, so like the cards that you can actually feel and move and see with like some gorgeous um, organisms on them. Um, and then the first thing I would do is elicit preconceptions. So basically learning is Addressing your own preconceptions, right? Getting some information and then going back and readdressing those. And that basically is the job that we have, is to address students' preconceptions. And it's not something we do in a traditional dissemination format. Um, and so active learning classes allow us to do this. And all of these activity ideas here, you can incorporate preconceptions into. So how that would look in this example is I would have them line up their species from most to least related um, using one particular organism and then document their list and the criteria, you know, why are these two more related to than, than these two? Um, and so hopefully they would tell me things like, well, they look really similar, you know, or, or things like that, okay? And maybe they would mention something like DNA. Then I would do some direct instruction. I would do 10, 15 minutes of lecturing. And then this piece is really important because if we don't ever have students confront their preconceptions, they don't ever truly learn. Um, and when you survey students after they get out of college, a lot of the times that's what we find is that those preconceptions that they've had since they were little, they have just stuck, 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 stuck. So the metacognition piece is, okay, now go back and change that according to what I just um, explained to you and think about that and what is your reasoning for doing that. So basically what we do in class is not just dissemination of information, but it's preconception and then address the preconception. So it's just over and over and over again, that's what we're doing over the course of the quarter, um, is preconceptions and metacognition. So, and then I have some other stuff down here, there, but you might just make a note because this activity that, that you wrote up here, the notes that you have, those are gonna be used when you're making your learning progression. So you might just make a note that if you want to develop your idea further, that um, using those three, it would be a really good idea. Okay. So here's the good news. <laughs> we have more than two hours. We don't get a semester, but we get a quarter. <laughs> so let's create activities and course designs that allow students to use discipline-specific knowledge. Because, for instance, in the study that was done by Schwartz et al., with the high school, right, with the high school on burden curriculum, 
those students actually did fewer topics. They covered fewer topics in their high school curriculum, but they did better in college-related courses. And one of the hypotheses behind this is that we need students to actually use the, the information that we're giving them. They need to be immersed in the field for a good amount of time to be able to use discipline-specific skills, right? And so that's where active learning comes in, is they're going to get a chance to actually use discipline-specific uh, uh, skills. And if they do that in one area, they hopefully will be able to transfer that to other concepts. And there's only a couple of studies that have, that have shown that. But again, it's a very weak field in terms of research. So go into that, please. So here's the exciting thing, and the thing that no one told us um, when we first started teaching, that we are not just disseminators of information. Mocks should not be uh, intimidating. Flipped classrooms should not be intimidating, because we are not actually just here to disseminate information. Our jobs are much, much bigger than that. We are actually the master designers of our course. And so what we want to figure out is how are we going to design our course so that we can fit in activities like those that, that teach students to immerse themselves in our field. And the first step to that is figuring out what the big ideas of your course are. Now, you guys probably have um, on your syllabus you know, chapters that you follow or modules that you're using that give some framework to your course, right? Um, and so I've done this for Bio 101. Um, I've given a lot of, lot of thought to this. Textbooks are so misleading because they cover absolutely everything. And following those step by step by step often leads to a, a ballooned course load, um, especially for, for, for biology where the, the, the amount of knowledge just continues to balloon and balloon and balloon. And so just as an, an example, I know you can't see the fine print, but the description is really important. Um, these big ideas, they're bringing together these various concepts and isolated facts. They're making meaning of those. So that's what we want our big idea to be. So my first module is chemistry for biologists. So we're looking at matter is composed of atoms. Atoms bond to form molecules which make up cells, the smallest unit of life. The way in which molecules interact and move influences cell functioning and cell-to-cell -cell communication. So you can see that the grain site is pretty big there. Okay, so this is the biggest grain size of the class. For today, um, our big idea is unburdening the course. And then our learning target was actually um, being able to relate um, an active learning classroom to big ideas. Okay, so you can do this for anything that you do. So what I'd like for you to do is use your activity. If you need your sticky note back, you, back, you can grab it. <laughs> you didn't write anything down. And I want you to create a big idea for that activity. Okay? So what big idea does that activity fall under? And that big idea, it will be a rough sketch. This is obviously some, something that takes a long time to develop. But we're just getting an idea here. <coughs> big idea, bless you, goes in the red circle up top. Let me show, what, show you what this looks like for my chemistry unit. All right, so basically for all five of these, I have one of these maps. And this map has really helped me to understand where my holes are for students um, within each big idea, but it's also given me a map for unburdening my own curriculum. Uh, and so it's really a, a wonderful, um, nice linear process for, for this stuff that just seems so, so big and so many different topics. It's a nice way to lay it out. So let me show you what that looks like. So for my learning progression for chemistry, I have four learning targets. And I showed you your learning target for today. These are students' learning targets for the big idea of chemistry. Now in these learning progressions, you could have three learning targets, you could have eight learning targets. They come in all different sizes, and I will have multiple sizes for you next Tuesday. So let me show you what, what students are doing here. So my big idea, chemistry for biologists, I read you the description. Let me just do the first learning target. So I've got the size, shape, and polarity of ions, molecules, and compounds affect their function. So that fits in with the big idea of um, chemistry for biologists. So now using your activity, we're kind of working backwards here, um, but using your activity and your big idea, um, I want you to come up with a learning target. So what will 
Um, what does your activity address specifically within that big idea? And that goes in your learning target space. Are these learning targets sequential or are they um, comprehensive? Great, um, good question. So these are sequential in my course. So we start with the one on the far left and they move up, 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 up. So they're arrayed, they're arranged in this uh, uh, arrangement because they're showing a, se a sequence. You can see on the far left is prior knowledge. That's everything that they're doing in previous modules, but stuff that they're also doing out of class before they come in and they get ready for the first learning target. Everything at the end is what this is gonna tie into in the course later on. So it's a timeline of sorts. And um, it's really helpful, at least in the field of biology, to be able to see that mapped out time-wise. The learning targets, the grain size, that's, that's often a, a big question about these learning progressions. And that's like, well, how big do I go there, right? It's like, well, I could combine one and two into one learning target. We'll work a little bit on that next Tuesday, too. Um, at this point, get something down, um, something that relates to your activity that falls under your big idea. So. How do we know that our students have actually met these learning targets? That's the next thing we're going to talk about. Okay, so let's go back. <laughs> All right. So Anu was asking a couple of questions about um, the targets themselves. So the targets themselves, the key here is that they are a subset of this big idea. They are the main ideas underneath that big idea. So they're nested within the big idea but they're not necessarily nested within each other, and as you were suggesting, they don't necessarily need to be linear, but they absolutely positively have to be measurable because you need to know whether your students have gotten that learning target or not. And so the depth of your class, so we need to have depth. If I, can't, if I don't have time for adequate depth in all of these, then I need to be getting rid of one. I need to be rearranging things is, is the idea there that, that we'll work further on next Tuesday. But the idea here is that, okay, well, size, shape, and polarity of ions, molecules, and compounds affect their function. What am I going to do to have students understand this? I'm going to disseminate some information, for sure. I'm going to have them do a ton of work out of class. They're going to watch online videos. They're going to do some reading. They're going to report to discussion board. They're going to take quizzes. But, but what are they going to do in class where I can really help facilitate the meeting of preconceptions and metacognition? And that is the list of student-centered activities. And you guys have this just for reference, you know, when you're doing course planning or if you're wanting to make your classes more active. This is, right now, I'm a Catalyst faculty on the change at the core. It's a, um, it's a STEM education initiative out of the National Science Foundation that we're one of eight universities in the nation actually doing this. There's a $2 million grant that Western has. And we're um, training STEM faculty in how to do this basically and make active learning classrooms. So this is a running list that we've been compiling for about a year now um, with sources and also explanations on how to do the actual activities. So I consider this an awesome resource. When I'm, when I'm thinking, okay, we really need to do a little more natural selection. What do I want to do there? I will start flipping through this and thinking, okay, yeah, that might fit. Yeah, that, it might be a good idea to do idea to do that. I'm already doing a guided inquiry activity, but you know, maybe I should do an ABCD card, or maybe I need to do exit slips today. So this is like the stuff, this is the depth that you're doing in your classroom. So it's a really good resource. We're not really going to use it today, but I want to refer to it because that's actually what happens underneath your learning, uh, your learning targets. So it needs to be measurable, and we need to know what we're doing for depth. So right now you have your depth and your like kind of loosely formulated idea for an activity. That's your formative assessment. So that activity that you posted up here, that goes right there. So you're going to transfer that down. And for me, for my learning target of molecular polarity, I have an activity, a guided inquiry activity on osmosis. I also have them do a bunch of other stuff. But that's my depth in my course. That's where they're actually literally wrestling with preconceptions and addressing it with metacognition. So what I want you to do is copy your idea down, just, just a quick, quick thing here, um, but then go back and how are you going to know, how is this going to be measurable? For today, today's is measurable for me because I'm going to be able to walk around and see that you have one whole column filled out on your learning progression. For these students, I know they're going to be able to do this because I'm going to evaluate these guided inquiry activities, and I, put, I actually gave you a copy of that guided inquiry activity in your 
handouts so you can see what one of those scaffolded activities looks like. I know it's for biology, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but that's what they're going to give me. They're going to be able to assess the polarity of ions, molecules, and compounds. So if you just want to take a minute and write success criteria for your activity. Yep. This is your formative assessment. So that goes right there. And how are you going to know they did that activity well? That's your success criteria. That tells you if they met their learning target or not. So the learning target is what we have on the yellow slip. So this is the formative assessment. This is actually your activity. The learning target is what this is nested under. Okay. So the goal is for each learning target to have a formative assessment. Yes. And every formative assessment must have one activity. Or yes, more. or more. And they all have success criteria. So you have explicit success criteria that you know if they have met their learning target or not by participating in all these activities. Now the learning target may have multiple concepts, so is it all right if the activity takes just one subset oh, yeah. of the learning target? Yeah, and, and sometimes with these, like, oops, I don't know what happened there. Sometimes with these, I will have, um, like for my entire chemistry one, I will have one activity that I use here and here. So that one activity incorporates multiple learning targets. For other learning targets, sometimes I don't have a guided inquiry activity, but I do things like A, B, C, D, and think, write, pair, share, those kinds of things. So, so you can have an activity that just targets one learning target, or it can span multiple learning targets, which I really, really like, <laughs> because what it does is it forces them to think back to previous learning targets and tie those into future learning targets. So when I'm creating activities, I'm, I'm oftentimes incorporating as many learning targets as I can um, they end up being long, and I kind of break them up a little bit, but under the same theme. Um, so like Carrie's suggestion with malaria, tying in multiple learning targets with malaria. For this, I use hyponatremia um, and dehydration, and so I'm able to tie in multiple learning targets under a common theme. With just one activity? One activity. Mm -hmm. How do they have a background to or is the activity, part of the activity is to give them the background? Yeah, so in the, in the example I gave you, there's not a lot of background in it, but in most of my other ones, there's quite a bit of text that they're actually reading. And they're getting background. But before they come into class, it's not on that one, but your gray boxes, they're doing an online lecture. They're doing about three hours out of class per module. They're doing a lot of work out of class. They handle it very well. It's a wonderful transfer of responsibility. They're accountable for it, and it makes it so that we're just like ready to go once they get into class. So that we can actually do things like these kinds of special topics to tie in the learning targets. Your classes aren't shorter, are they? <laughs> no. <laughs> because there's more work to do outside. Yeah, no, um, but one thing that I have changed that I really, really like is I've, I've left the 50-minute class model, and I like the hour and 20-minute um, when you start having an active learning classroom, having a larger block of time to be able to both disseminate information and complete an activity for one learning target is really, really awesome. 50 minutes, super hard. I tried that for about two years. <laughs> it's really hard. So you actually changed your class times? I did. How, how do you do that? I just asked the chair. Oh. <laughs> and I, and I, I didn't even know it was like something that was available to me. I just ran into her in the hall and I was like, you know, it would be really great if I had more time in class. Okay, let's do that. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> and the, the other thing is that this movement towards active learning and unburdening classrooms and having more of a scaffolding for classes is moving out to the rest of the departments. Right now it's kind of centered in STEM education. There's a lot of movement, a lot of activity, a lot of money, but that's going to be in the coming years moving out to other departments as well. And already all of the department chairs and all the deans are on board with what's happening with the end. C-Corp project. So there's a lot of support within departments. So if you go to your chair and ask, I, I think you might be surprised at the kind of support you'd get. I was. <laughs> so why don't we do this? Um, so it feels like 
uh, so I'm coming out and taking a different role now. So um, it feels like just from the questions that you guys asked, if this was my class, that I feel like things are still muddy um, in terms of what is formative assessments, what is success cri criteria, learning target, and big idea. Um, and so I, I could do something, like in my class planning, I could plan out an ABCD card to see where people are on that. Or I could just um, have them probably just pair and share. Um, and so I, would, so I would ask you guys, if you don't mind, um, to pair up with someone and explain the relationship between formative assessment, success criteria, learning targets, and, big, and the big idea. So for discussions, you can also use ABCD cards. Um, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes my discussions in class go like that way. <laughs> and I'm like, woo, what did you do Saturday night? Um, so they can use their cards for when they're done discussing too. Like, fine, if you want to move on and you're done discussing, go ahead, talk about Saturday night, but show me with green, you know, that you're done. Um, and then I, then I know, because otherwise sometimes I just let it go too long, and I'm like, ah, wasting so time. So I understand the red and the green, but what are the... Blue and yellow. <laughs> We're going to do that, but I, oh. just one minute. Okay. Promise. Okay. Um, so, did you guys have any questions about that? Okay. Okay. I guess formative assessment, but you've given yeah. us a bunch of examples of how to do it. I know, but I really didn't explain formative assessment, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to use the jargon that you're going to hear. Um, without using kind of extraneous terms. But if we just go back to this for a minute. So formative assessment are low stakes assessments where you're getting feedback. The best kinds of formative assessment are the kinds where you're getting immediate feedback. And that's what the ABCD card does for you. But other assessments like the scratch quizzes where they keep scratching until they get the answer right. Those are very fun um, environments for students and they get immediate feedback, and you get immediate feedback, and it's just like a win-win. Are these graded? Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so all, yeah, low stakes. Yeah. Low stakes, though, yeah. So when they miss something, if they scratch and they don't get it right the first time, they lose half a point. It's so like, how do you record all that in a bunch class? They, um, they add up their scores. I don't have them with me. My TA has them, but they... Um, on their scratch sheet, they add up their score, so it's just like group number and score, and then in the grade book, I click on like group eight, all the people are there, and you're just like eight, 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 eight or nine, 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 nine. So you enter the scores right away? Uh-huh. It's very fast. It's very easy. Uh, how do you get scratch cards? Um, the department orders them, and they're awesome. They're called IFAT, and they are cheap, and they're so, they are the easiest thing to add to your class and they are so easy and they are so fun and it just is a really fun environment <laughs> and I don't even print quizzes I just do slides you know you put a question up there on a slide and they start scratching you could do it in pairs um, it really is designed for groups though so these really aren't designed for individuals but so, so the scratch card is just like a multiple choice letter and they scratch off the letter, but it corresponds to something that's on the slide. Yep, yep. So you okay. match all your answer options all right. to where I the dots understand. are. Right. Yeah. So low stakes, half a point if you get something wrong, but it gives them a chance. They're getting tested over and over and over, but they don't realize they're getting tested, right? That's, that's the thing, is that you're asking them questions, addressing them to those preconceptions that you know are there, um, and you're doing that in ways that are formative so that they're low stakes. So it's a 10-point quiz and you knock off half a point for being wrong. Yeah, but they could keep scratching. For me, I have four answer options. You can buy five answer option cards too, but, but after they, they scratch one, they get it wrong, point, minus point 0.5, scratch another, then they're down to um, 0.25, and then zero if, they, if it's the last one. So could, they could miss a whole point, but it would be really, it's, it's hard to do that. You don't do that very often. Okay, so that's, that's formative assessment. These ideas up here, I would consider these, some of these could be made into ABCD card questions, but a lot of these would go into something called a guided inquiry activity, which is the one I have up there in red. And um, what I was just sharing the guided inquiry activity here, and, and, and he's like, well, gosh, it's just so different from my discipline, you know? But, but, but ideally, like what we told the C-Core folks this summer is, Take the most difficult concept in your course, the one you know that students are having trouble with, and come up with an activity for that. 
Just do one in the next year. And then do everything else the same. Maybe throw in some ABCD cards or something else. But, but come up with one of these scaffolded activities where the intellectual leaps are short. They can work through and there's very few places where they're going to get stuck. You're walking around, you're guiding them as they butt up against their misconceptions with metacognition. And um, these are fantastic. Um, Deb Donovan and I did a study last winter um, looking at a class that did like some of this stuff in it, but then my other section did full-blown activities, full-flipped active learning classroom, and they did 10% better on every single exam. They also did better on a content inventory and they had better attitudinal shifts. Um, so it's, there's, a, there's a huge research base for active learning. But anything that you can add into your class is beneficial. But if you can create one of these, and, and most of us in our disciplines, we don't have these. Nobody like sells these, you know? Um, you can find some ideas online, but um, we're having to write these, and that takes a long time. It's best when it's collaborative with someone else in your department, but they're totally worth it. And these are graded exercises too? I, I grade groups, so I don't know if you guys have, if anybody has like large classes, but um, so I grade 32 of these. So that's what I'm grading tonight. <laughs> so 32 per section. So they get a group grade. So low stakes. Okay, so what we're going to do next week is continue working on learning progressions, but we're going to really focus on number two and what that looks like. It's a very complicated picture, but I found there are some things, some strategies you can apply to your learning progressions that can help you to prune. The other thing you can do is move some content out of class, and I've had a lot of success with that. Um, we have lots of help through ATUS in terms of um, capturing some lecture, um, short 20, 15 minute lectures that they can watch out of class before they come into class. So you can unburden your class by moving some of it out of class as well. So do our own lectures out of class? Mm -hmm. Yep. How do we do that? Um, you can get a hold of ATUS and you can use their media room and they'll video you or they'll come into your class. You just teach your class like you normally do during the course of the quarter and they come to all your classes and they video you. Wow. So you kind of kill two birds with one stone. It's not as good a quality, but um, it's great. It's fine. It's better than like, the, I tried the Camtasia and I, it wasn't as good. You didn't like the Camtasia approach? It was totally fine. I, I don't want to dismiss it at all because it's a really quick, easy, simple thing. Like if you have a 10 minute Camtasia you want to post, you know, great, fantastic. But if you want something long term, um, I, I liked the uh, ATUS and I got better responses from students with that one. Okay, we're ready to use these. <laughs> okay, so now I need to assess you. We're at the end of the day, and I, I want to know some things from you. So here's how these work. Everybody has one, and you do an individual vote. And A, you always give them what their answer options are. You don't need to show the card. You just put a slide up, A, B, C, D. You know, they know what the colors are. A, I've moved some lecture content out of class, but I want to do more. B, I'm considering moving some content out of class. C, I do not want to move content out of class and prefer to prune learning targets, so that's just unburdening. Or D, I want to do a combination of moving content out of class and reducing overall course coverage. Just to be clear on the definition, when you say moving content out of class, you don't mean getting rid of content, no. you mean learning it differently. Putting it through textbook readings or um, online videos. It's something they do themselves. Yeah, something they do on their own out of class time. Okay. Our classroom is precious. Okay, so um, then you just fold it to what you think it is. And what, what I have students do is that when they vote, their individual, individual vote happens right here. And then as I'm in the front of the class, I can see everyone's vote, but they can't see each other's. Unless they're like, <laughs> and you can tell if they're doing it. And you can see they're like nervous about it, right? So that's that anonymity. So first of all, everybody votes. Nobody gets a pass out. If you don't understand, or you just, none of the options fit you, you can't figure it out, it's a non-starter, you're white. <laughs> so literally everybody votes. So let's vote right now. We're gonna vote on three. So fold your cards. One, and you can do white. Just for the course you're looking at. Okay, ready? One, two, three, vote. 
Okay, and this is great. And we really, we should like take turns coming up here. Anyone want to come up here and see what it looks like? Because it's like awesome. Or just like turn around. It's the best, you guys, seriously. Because you know right away when you have a rainbow, you're like, okay, let's go back. <laughs> it really is very powerful. And then the other thing you can do, sometimes I do that and we stop. But sometimes we do that and I'm like, okay, now get in your groups, show each other your answer and defend your answer. Um, and that's a really powerful way to do it too. But oh, it gets that, that individual cool. thing first. How do I get these? <laughs> I will send them to you. Yeah, they're online. Yeah. If you <laughs> signed in here, I'll send you all the handouts electronically for. Oh, and what we can send out is the Ed Prather video demonstrating those. He is the master of these. Um, and then I'm also, I, I worked with ATUS today to, because I'm using these in conjunction with the scratch sheets, and that's become something really powerful in class. And so when that video is done, hopefully next week, then um, I can send that out to him so you can see what that looks like on our campus. Okay, now now I forgot what you guys voted. <laughs> I had, okay, I had, so, okay, that's the other thing that I do. I'm like, I report out to the class what I'm seeing. Not during the quizzes, but but ordinarily, if I get an A, B, C, D card, and I'm like, okay, I'm seeing a lot of B's in the classroom, a couple D's, and and maybe just a, like one A. So I would tell you what I'm seeing, so they're not like super curious. Um, so so what that means is okay, great. So that okay, so that is super helpful for me. Now I know where you guys, what where you are. And uh, that, that's going to inform me for my next class. So the key to formative assessment is it has to change what you do. You can't just, can't just do it and walk away. <laughs> so it has to actually inform you for your future, whatever, clarification lectures or whatever, activity ideas. Um, so that informs me. So let's go back. We're at the end of our time together. Let's go back and look and see what we have done today. So I talked with you guys about learning progressions, using the big idea to develop learning targets, success criteria, and you have the beginning of an activity. The learning target for today was that you would demonstrate the linkage between class activities, learning targets, and big ideas by filling out a learning progression. So how did we do? Honest answers are the most helpful. One, two, three, vote. Great, so we have A's and we have B's, and we're pretty split half and half on that. Great, so what that would tell me is, um, so for my next class, you know, we would leave, and my next class, we would start the day, you know, working on the linkage between big ideas and learning targets and um, success criteria. So, is that like telling me my time's up? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're like, it is. Okay, so anyway, if you want to carry on with this, we can do more of this next Tuesday. Um, but I'm, I'm really glad you guys came. So thank you. Thank you. You want to start last? Yeah. Yeah. Um, explain exactly what will we cover. What do you mean by guided like, like practical planning? Plan? What does that mean? So what we're going to do is is do more work on our learning progressions. But then we're going to talk about skills within disciplines that we can use to apply to this to unburden it.